May I have your attention? Are you still coming in? Okay. When you all get seated and I have your attention, I really would like you to listen to this because it's for your, your future and your good and your benefit, okay? Today we have Hilton Hollis. Hilton graduated from FIT five years ago. He was born in Natchez, Mississippi, and he trained under Professor George Simonton, or he studied, and Mr. George Simonton is here today. You, how many of you know George? Thank you. And uh, what nicer, two talented a, a professor who's already uh, launched his career, he said, 40 years ago, and you taught it, you've been teaching at FIT 20 years, George. And Hilton, our baby, talented designer, extremely talented, uh, he was in this class, CL112, and I had the great pleasure of uh, becoming good friends and, it, and, and watching how his future formed and how successful he already is becoming and is, because uh, Hilton uh, was selected uh, to join the world's most famous designers in a fashion show event at Times Square to celebrate the New York City 2000 millennium. And it was the most beautiful dress to see the work of a young man, talented, on the uh, runway along with Oscar de la Renta, Carolina Herrera, and there came Hilton Hollis. It was uh, chilling. I loved it. And here he is today. He's going to uh, speak to you and share uh, the, his experiences. And that's important because he's a young one. He joins the roster at uh, FIT. This is a great school year attending and you, I hope you appreciate it because out of the school we've had Calvin Klein, Norma Kamali, uh, John Anthony, uh, Joe Barato, the CEO of Brioni. They've been guest speakers here and will be. These are all successful people and many, many others have come out of the school. Probably some I'm not naming, right? Yes. And uh, anyway, he's as we said, a great talent, and, uh, and George Simonton, our professor, as I said, was his uh, instructor, which I love seeing them together today. It's so beautiful. Um, and uh, what else was I gonna tell you about Hilton? Oh yes, in 2003, great, he joined Reba McIntyre to design a new line of clothing and after leaving Reba in May 2005, he joined a privately held company, which he is part of today. And his, the Hilton Hollis Collection will debut February 2006 for high-end retailers. And we, we see here some of Hilton's work that he was kind enough to bring. And uh, we're very, very proud of him. And one day I hope some of you will be invited to come back with a success story and speak to other young aspiring designers. And with that, I would love to have Hilton come and take the podium. It's a great honor for me. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Alice. Uh, just to give you guys a little bit of background about how I started, where I came from, things like that. Um, and I do think it makes a difference where you come from to know where you're going. Um, I grew up in Mississippi uh, on a 350-acre farm, far, far away from the fashion industry and far away from 7th Avenue. Um, my grandmother was an avid quilter. She did these beautiful patchwork quilts with thousands of pieces. And I remember as a small child, probably eight, nine years old, I used to sit there and watch her and see her quilt these beautiful masterpieces. And to me, it was art. 
Um, the idea of sewing fascinated me from an early age, so I started sewing when I was about eight or nine. Um, throughout my high school career and things, I started to make clothes for my mom, my sister, anyone that I could get to wear my clothes, I was putting it on them. Um, in 97, I moved to New York and started here at the Fashion Institute of Technology. Um, FIT to me at that point was a dream and a dream that actually had become reality in 97. Um, at FIT, I was very involved and very um, excited to be here. Um, I was in many classes, many classes that I wasn't required to take. I took them anyway just to get experience in different areas. I find that it's so important, um, although the program here is very diversified, it also, um, it's also important that you as individuals figure out what you want to do with your career, what you want to do with your degree, and take advantage of some of the other courses that FIT has to offer. Um, what I've found in going out in my own business is that uh, it's so important to know all different aspects of fashion. You need to know about PR, you need to do, uh, know about production, you need to know about photography, you need to know about artistic direction, um, just so many different areas. Um, so what I'm trying to say to you is that take full advantage of what this school has to offer. You guys are so privileged to be here. And you know, the year that I, was, uh, that I started here, we had 1,600 applicants, and I believe 400 got accepted. So that should say something. I'm sure it's the case today. Um, it's also important that while you're here, you start preparing yourself for launching your career and getting into the right fashion houses and working for the best people that you can possibly work for. Um, the last year here at FIT, I did the two-year program. And the last year here, I basically spent my time with George and really working hard to learn tailoring. To me, as a fashion design student, tailoring is probably the most important thing you could ever know. Because if you can tailor a garment, you can do absolutely any sort of garment there is. Um, tailoring is the basis of all design. You look at Italian fashion houses, you look at uh, Japanese fashion houses, they all base their principles and their design on, on tailoring. Um, also, the way that it's taught here at FIT, I have to say at the time, I thought, well, maybe this is kind of old-fashioned, or maybe this is kind of you know old school, if you want to say that say it that way. Um, the truth of the matter is, is tailoring never changes. Tailoring is classic. It is so important and so deeply rooted that if you learn the aspects and the um, the ideas of tailoring, you can go a long way, and you can apply it to many different areas. Um, while I was here, I was also working on my portfolio doing a lot of sketching. Um, I have to say that when I started here, I really couldn't sketch at all. And thankfully, um, a lot of the professors are, well, I could say all of the professors are really fantastic in teaching you um, the basis of sketching. Um, I think it's also important that you take as many uh, life drawing classes as you possibly can uh, to get the proportion and things like that right. Um, just to let you know, I probably had, I would say, at least five interviews right out of school. Um, my first interview was for probably my favorite designer there is, which is Oscar de la Renta. Um, it was a huge honor to go in and speak to Oscar and to get his advice and to talk to a man who has such an established career uh, was really inspiring to me. I didn't get the job, but it doesn't matter. I think that the more you interview, the more that you go on job interviews, the more that you meet famous individuals, not so famous individuals, the more you can talk and stand in public just like I am today, the more important you can make yourself to the industry. Um, the fact is that you know meeting Oscar has now led me into a, a lot of different areas. Um, I interviewed with him four di on four different occasions, um, and now when I see him on the street, I can easily go up to him and say, Mr. Lorenzo, how are you? You know, And he remembers me, and that's a good feeling. And it's good to associate yourself with that type of person. Um, also, I was interviewing with a few different companies at that time. I interviewed with Oscar De La Renta, as I said. 
I also interviewed with Dana Buckman. Um, I sent my resume to probably every fashion house in France, every fashion house in Italy. Um, I would say I sent out at least 120 resumes. And you know, whether you think that you're capable or that you want to work for Valentino or Terry Mugler or whoever it may be, you should send your resume out. You never know what that could bring. Um, this, the idea of your name passing across one of these very high-end, very amazing designers actually puts their name, your name, in their head. And that's so important because eventually you might meet them five years from now and they might say to you, oh, I remember your work, or oh, I remember your resume. I was impressed with the way you wrote your cover letter. You know, whatever the case may be, it's just so important. Um, so when I graduated, I actually uh, worked for Dana Buckman for a little over a year. Um, at the time, I thought, what a meaningless job this is. What, what a job. I go to work every day for 10 hours, and all I do is line sheets all day long. I scan in, you know, Dana's sketches, and I set them up on this beautiful sheet, and I put in all the fabric information. And to me, I went home every day, and I said, why am I working on the computer every day? I want to be a designer. I want to be a designer, and I want to create, and I want, you know, the world to see what I'm capable of. The truth of the matter is, is now I look back on it, and what an amazing experience it was. Um, you're going to get into jobs where you might not think that it's important. You might say, why is she having me do this? Or why is he, you know, having me go out and buy buttons on the street? And, you know, why is he making me wait around in the water on the streets of New York looking for some silly fabric that I don't even think is very pretty? But the, case, but the actual truth of it all is that you're going to be put in that position in one day and you should take full advantage of what these people are offering you. Because Dana wasn't offering me a design position to you know, see that I was fantastic and creative. She was giving me an opportunity to work in a company that was established. And you know, if I would have stayed there, I would have probably been the designer by now. Um, but after a year and a half, I decided that the job, I had already figured out how to do the line sheets. I would already figured all that aspect of it out. So I decided to go on and do something a little bit different. Um, that's when I actually met John Bartlett. And John was probably, is absolutely the most creative person I've ever worked for. Um, I worked for John for two seasons. And basically, my job there was to come in um, and look at the collection after it was all set and done from Italy. Um, and he would have me add additional like showstopper pieces into the collection, which is a great job to have because it's, you're creating excitement on the runway. Um, I was also doing a lot of sewing. I was also doing a lot of tailoring, things like that. Um, so those were all important aspects of John Bartlett's collection, and I was very pleased to work on it with him. Um, at that point, after the two seasons at John Bartlett, I started an evening wear collection, which was called Hilton Hollis as well. Um, the evening gown collection was mainly targeted at high-end customers. Uh, it was done in the couture methods of Paris. Um, and I use that term very loosely. Um, couture is something that is definitely um, out there, and it's a beautiful art. Although the word couture um, is often used to describe fashion that's created here in the United States. And the truth of the matter is, is that unless you're a part of the Chamber de Syndicale in Paris, you're not really creating couture. So that custom-made clothing is what I called uh, what I did. I actually dressed um, Joyce Brown, the president of FIT. I dressed a number of celebrities, a number of models, and things like that. Um, and then, unfortunately, September 11th came along. That put a lot of people out of business, including myself. Um, I meet designers up until today. I meet, like, you know, two designers every month that were affected by FIT, and I think everyone was. Uh, fortunately, you know, for all of us, um, we're beginning to, the industry's beginning to pick up, and we're beginning to move into a buying direction, I hope. Um, after September 11th and closing my business, um, I had to find ways of making money. And as 
people who are living in New York City, people who are working in the fashion industry, this is something that's so important because you need to be diversified and you be, need to be able to take yourself out of, you know, if you're a fashion designer, you need to be able to say, you know, I am a fashion designer and I know what I'm doing and I'm great at it, but at this point in the industry, there's only this number of jobs and one of those jobs is not necessarily for me, so what else am I gonna do to subsidize my income while I'm trying to figure out how to get back into it? And that happens a lot. I mean, the industry's not easy at all. You can have a job one day and it can be gone tomorrow. Companies go out of business every single day. And it's just so important to understand that it's not always about your talent. It's the fact that, you know, like I said, companies go out of business. That's, it's a part of reality. Um, so basically during that time of after September 11th, I did everything from makeup to freelancing for fashion stylists. Um, I went from, you know, a pretty good salary to making practically nothing. But, you know, I made it. So after that whole situation with September 11th, um, about a year later, I started working for Reba McIntyre. Um, I was approached with this collection, and the reason why I was approached is I had made some connections uh, throughout those last two years prior to working for Reba, um, and I had interviewed for a job. The person I interviewed with, best friend, actually started the collection with Reba, and she called me and said, you know, I think you'd be really great for this job. I'd like you to meet Reba. And I went on the interview, met her, we totally clicked. It was a good, you know, combination. Um, so doing that definitely taught me some things about myself as a designer, and it also taught me some things about um, doing a large collection for a major department store. Um, the Reba collection was exclusively for Dillard's. Dillard's has 350 stores across the United States. Um, I worked with Drew Corbusier, who is one of the founding members of Dillard's. She's one of the daughters of Mr. Dillard. Um, also worked with um, Jim Stockman, who's the vice president of Dillard's. And to be a designer and to work with such high-level people is pretty uncommon because when you're working with major department stores, you're usually working with the buyers. Um, buyers can be very difficult at times. Uh, they usually want to be designers, but they're not. <laughs> they like to change your collection all the time. And for me to work with Jim Stockman and Drew Corbusier, it was a godsend because these are people who, you know, they run the entire Dillard's organization and they respected me. They respected me and they respected Reba. Um, so with that collection, we launched about a year ago. Um, the sales have been fantastic. Uh, the response has been amazing. Of course, she is a major celebrity. And, you know, going into it, I thought, well, you know, she's, she's such a big celebrity, how am I ever going to be recognized for my work with such a huge celebrity? And fortunately, Reba's the type of person who loved to say that she had a designer named Hilton Hollis that was working with her, and that was fantastic. But what you all need to realize is that's not always the case. Many designers out there don't necessarily give you recognition when you think you should, when you think you should deserve it. Um, and that's not the most important thing. Take advantage of the fact that the designer is actually offering you a position and that you are being associated with such people. Um, after leaving Reba in May, I started my own collection. Um, I had been in talks for about two or three years with a number of different financial backers uh, who I'd met along the way. and. Fortunately, I found one who doesn't own the rights to my name and who just is a huge support both artistically and financially. Um, it's so important if you decide to go in business for yourself that you find someone who you can trust. Find someone who is a friend and also a business partner. Um, and it's not, it's not that hard to do. You have to keep your eyes open, though, at all times. Sometimes the person who you're actually going to go into business with or for is someone right under you, someone right beside you, who you might not recognize as such a person, but they are. Um, my financial backer 
is Ted Glenn. He's uh, part of Glenn International, which is an international fabric company. Um, we do fabric production in Asia and all over Europe. Um, and to be working with someone like that is a great thing for a designer because I'm able to actually design my own fabrics. Um, I'm able to have a lot more control over the fabric production aspect of things. Um, and these are all important aspects of being with him. Um, also one of the most important things for any new fashion designer or anyone going into the industry is being able to put yourself out there. Being able to put yourself out on the line and having people critique your work and understanding that, you know, just because your work's not right for someone, that doesn't mean that it's not right for someone else. Um, it's constructive criticism that's always important. Um, for me, I always ask people, well, you know, can you give me anything negative? Can you give me some negative response to what you see, what I'm presenting? Because I feel like the only way to, as a designer that you can move forward is to have negative criticism. Uh, to understand your faults and understand your weaknesses is to understand how you can better yourself. Um, Another aspect of starting your own business that you have to be very aware of is that unless you have a full staff, which I don't, um, you are going to be involved in every aspect of the design process. You're going to be involved in production. You're going to be involved in pricing, in establishing business relationships. It's a lot of hard work. Um, I work probably 10 to 12 hours a day. I work on Saturdays. Um, Sundays are usually my days off, but sometimes I feel like sketching on Sunday afternoon. And I think in the beginning, it's just so important that you feel 150% in love with what you're doing. If you don't love the fashion industry, then I suggest you leave it. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. Um, being at FIT also taught me that if you want something bad enough, you can achieve it. Um, if you want to be a designer, if you want to have your name out there, if you want to see your name in Women's Wear Daily and Vogue and wherever, it's all possible. You just have to believe in yourself and you have to believe in your product. Um, when you start to question your product and when you start to question yourself, then you need to rethink your whole, you know, idea of what you're doing. Um, there are a few things that I wanted to mention also about, um, there are three things that make me understand the fashion industry and make me stronger in the industry. Um, one is making yourself known. Um, like I said from the very beginning, go on every single interview that you can, meet every individual that you can in the industry. Um, if you see someone, perfect example, I saw John Vervados. I was in Paris two weeks ago at PV, at Premier Vision. I saw John Vervados on the airplane on the way home. I said to him, Mr. Varvatos, I admire your work, it's a pleasure to meet you, and he was so nice. Take advantage of these situations. You know, you don't have to be a stalker, but you can at least say hello to these people. They're not going to be, you know, some people may be rude to you, but for the most part, I think the people will be nice. Um, but get yourself out there, make yourself known. If you have any opportunities that come along to put your name out there, whether it's a fashion show that you can enter into, um, if it's a friend of a friend who has a friend who's a, a model or a stylist, give them some clothes, let them get your name out there because it's just, it's your name and you have to build it. Um, the next thing is to strive to do what your heart says. If you believe it in your heart, you can achieve it. Believing in yourself, believing in your product, again, is the most important thing. Uh, and believing in your career is important. And probably the most important thing to me, which is to only do things that you are proud of. Um, a lot of times I do clothes that, or I design an outfit that not, doesn't necessarily meet my expectations, and I will not put a label in it. If you're not proud of what you do and you're not proud of uh, what you've accomplished, then you need to rethink what you're trying to put out there. You want to always put 150% into everything that you do and you want people to look at you and say, wow, they really gave it their all and they're really you know, accomplishing what they've set out to do. Um, so with those things, I'll take some questions if you guys have anything to ask. Yes.
Right. I actually um, applied for a design assistant position, and to me, design assistant means assisting the designer, which I was, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be designing anything. So for that to be in your mind, you should really rethink you know, who you work for. And you know, starting out in a company, you're definitely not going to be designing first, your first year out of school. Um, you might get to be involved in some different aspects of the design process, but to think that you're going to be designing you know, a big portion of the line, it's probably not going to happen. Anyone else? Um, actually, I did not do an internship. I did work for George uh, here and there whenever he needed my help. And he was also just a huge support to me and just going up to his, uh, his office to see what he did and things like that. It's probably the one thing that I do wish I would have done more than anything is to do an internship. Um, it's so important to be able to get out there and, and, like I said, getting your name out there is so important. And, you know, unfortunately, I didn't have someone telling me these things like when you guys do at, at this point. Um, so, you know, definitely take advantage of internships. Yes. The question was, what did I learn with Mr. Simonton that was instrumental in my career? Um, I have to embarrass you now. <laughs> um, being in George's class was just amazing to me because you look at this man's career, and no matter whether you think he's the best designer in the world or the worst designer in the world, you have to admire a man who has had 20 years of experience, or 25, on 7th Avenue. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. He's in Neiman Marcus. That's so difficult to achieve in anyone's career. His suits are absolutely amazing. He dresses you know, major celebrities. He's dressed Elizabeth Taylor. I mean, who can say that, you know? And Alice Papazian. Um, but he taught, me, he taught me to understand who my customer was. He taught me who to understand who the customer is, who you're trying to target, and to work hard. And if you believe in something, then you can achieve it. Um, it's all about working hard and dedicating yourself to something. Um, you know, I would love to say that, oh, I could you know, go out and have a good time on a you know, Thursday night and you know, not have to work the next day. Or, but the truth of the matter is, is you, if you want to be a successful designer, if you want to be successful at anything, you have to dedicate your, yourself to it. You really do. Work ethic. It's all a matter of work ethic and just dedication. Yes. Absolutely. I do my own line sheets. I mean, I'm, I'm launching a million dollar business in the next year and, you know, my spring collection is right now, I'm, uh, next week I'll be going to Atlanta. I'm showing at one of the best showrooms in Atlanta called Shepard and Tucker for Atlanta Market Week. Um, here in New York, I'm in Alal and Associates, which is one of the top showrooms. Um, I have some of the best salespeople in New York and, you know, the truth of the matter is, 7 o'clock at night, I'm still in the office, I'm doing my line sheets, I'm labeling, you know, my garments, I'm, you know, going back and forth with the factories. I wake up every morning at 6.30 just so I can catch my factory in Hong Kong before they close for the evening. And, you know, with the Asian influence in today's industry, um, you know, everything's being produced in Asia for the most part. I would say 80 to 90 percent of the goods that are coming into the United States are being produced in Asia. And you could work 24 hours a day. Um, you know, they're 12 hours ahead of us, and you could literally work 24 hours a day. And sometimes you do. You know, uh, emailing at 3 o'clock in the morning, I've done it, and I'm con I'll continue to do it. Um, because if you're trying to meet a deadline, if you're trying to, you know, get your collection in before market, you do whatever it takes, you know. I've, I've sewn sequins on the belt, that belt right there. I sewed, I sewed the sequins on myself, you know. I don't have a huge staff. I have someone who supports me and who does my fabric ordering, and she does a lot, a lot of the follow-up with the fabrics and tracking and things like that. But until I start to get orders, 
why do I need anyone? You can do it all yourself. If you learn all the aspects of what, you know, doing the line sheets, you know, knowing how to do beating layouts and things like that, like knowing all the different aspects of design and production and, and those different things, you can do it all yourself and you don't need a huge staff. And it also keeps your overhead low. Yes. Not at all. Not in a million years. Um, the thing is, is, like I said, if you meet the right people, it's all about timing and it's all about understanding what you want to do in your career and meeting all the right people and have, being in, in the right place in the right time. Um, fortunately, I have known my financial backer for five years. Um, I started out by going to him as an assistant designer, asking him to show me, you know, wool tweed or something. And, you know, back in the day, I asked for wool tweeds and we struck up a conversation and he was so nice and I thought, wow, this is a great guy, like, you know, I'll continue to buy fabrics from him. Five years later, he's giving me a large sum of money to start a collection. So, it's just keep your, keep your connections. Always write down names. Whenever you meet someone, I don't know about you guys, but I'm horrible with names. So I always write down names whenever I get back to my office. If I were to meet someone at an event or something, I'll take a napkin really quickly and I'll write down the name and I'll write what, you know, what they do. And it's just so important to remember people because you never know. Like, never burn your bridges either because, believe me, um, not, in the, not in the garment industry I did this, but... Back when I was like right out of high school, I had a summer job once, and um, I worked for a lady in a florist. And basically, I was delivering flowers and occasionally doing a few things in in the florist. And she ended up being Andre Leon Talley's best friend, the editor at large at Vogue. So for me to have burned a bridge and said, you know what, I don't want to work for you no more. I don't like it here, you know, and I just I up and left one day, you know, and said, I don't want to work for you anymore. But that's not any way to handle things. I regret it. I absolutely regret it. Um, because I could call her right now and say, hi, you know, could, I'm doing my own line now. Do you think you could introduce me to your friend? No. <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> and I kick myself all the time for it. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Um, I'm in the bridge market, and bridge right now is kind of a dirty word. We don't use it. We don't use it that often anymore. Um, it's the price range of like a Dana Buckman, Ellie Tahari, Ellen Tracy. Um, my target customer is 35 to 55. Um, she's not that perfect body that everyone aspires to be. I'm definitely dressing real women with a real lifestyle. Um, but as you can see, my clothes are not frumpy and dumb like a lot of the bridge designers. <laughs> um, they're definitely younger and more contemporary on the contemporary edge of things, uh, but with a real uh, easy fit, uh, more of a classic fit. If you do a little bit of research. Um, I always find it interesting to go on to like the Neiman Marcus website, look at designers and look at like their pants sizing and see if they do classic fit, if they do modern fit, because that tells you a lot about the companies and it tells you a lot about like what their target market is. Yes. Well, we are currently showing to Neiman Marcus, Bergdorf Goodman's, Harrods of London, uh, Emmer Somerset, which is another big English store. Um, we're also showing um, to Nordstrom. Ultimately, I would love to be in Neiman Marcus. I mean, that's, that's the ultimate store for me, and I think it's just the epitome of taste and sophistication. Um, I definitely think my clothing fits that whole idea of what they're going for. Um, and, you know, me being from a southern background, I understand the way women dress. Um, I think that overall, women in the south and in, you know, the southern part of the, of the world even, women still dress up, you know. It's an art that people are really kind of going away from. Um, now it's all about sweats and jeans. I mean, there's nothing wrong with jeans, but, you know, women still dress down there, which I like. 
Yes. Right. Um, there are a lot of designers that are doing the same sort of price levels that I'm doing, although I do find that I'm kind of putting myself onto more of a young designer look. Um, it's definitely more of a contemporary look with a classic fit, which is definitely going to kind of get me into a niche that's not being filled at this point. If you go out and you do a little research and you look at the designers that are selling in those price points, most of the designers are either cutting their garments really large and boxy, um, or they're on the extreme other side of things, which is to cut really tight and slim. I don't know if how much you guys know about measurements, but for instance, biceps of jackets, which is always something that George Simonson taught me, um, the bicep and the cross shoulder is always like the most important thing you could do in a jacket. And accomplishing something um, with measurements is going to really identify you into a certain niche. Um, my jackets tend to be a little bit fuller in the bicep. It gives them a little bit more room in the back and also throughout the hips. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't want to design a collection that makes someone look dumpy, makes them look boxy, because to me, if you don't have such a, an amazing figure, fitting a garment on you properly, you can look so much slimmer. And a lot of my customers that I do private, private work for often say, wow, your jackets are amazing because they make me feel so much slimmer. You know, they make me feel confident, which is the most important thing. Um, making someone feel confident about what they're wearing um, automatically gives you sales. You know, if, if it looks great on them, they're going to buy it. And I think a lot of the clothes that are out there just, uh, it's, they kind of lose sight of who the customer is. Anyone else? Oh, I can't see. Okay. Right. Um, my suggestion to you, if and you know, I think all of us who are in the design area, I think we all aspire to be our own. You know, have our own labels. And with that in mind, I definitely suggest that you take business classes here at FIT. I did take two business classes. One was more of uh, marketing, and uh, the other was more manufacturing. Um, but they're so important. Uh, to understand how the business really works, um, you know, pick up a few books. I, if I don't know something, I go to the library and I find a book that tells me what I should need, what I should know. Um, perfect example is when I was doing a collection here at FIT. I actually went with George Simonson to Italy, and we presented a collection with five of the top fashion design schools in the in the world. And at that time. I thought I knew a lot about sewing, but obviously I didn't know that much because I got to certain things that I was having problems with. I went to the library, I found a book on couture sewing, I read the book in two days, and I went back and I started sewing again. And it all made sense then, you know? Um, it's all about absorbing what you have around you, so definitely take advantage of everything this school has to offer. I mean, FIT is by far, in my opinion, the most amazing fashion design school that you could go to. I mean, it's amazing. Um, the, the fact that all the people in the industry come here and they look at FIT as such a well-rounded school is a really amazing thing. Um, I've, I've actually interviewed many, many designers who go to other schools in the city. I won't name names. <laughs> but you can totally, like, I don't even have to look at their resume to tell who went to FIT and who didn't. Because you know, it's, it's just a matter of how they present themselves. And for people who want to be totally on the end of artistic expression, go to another school. If you want to be artistic expression, business, and technical, then this is a school to be in. This is it. Right. I mean, this course is amazing because, like I said, 
the things that you learn from this course are about all the people in the industry who you want to be associated with. And I promise you, if you, I'm not saying everybody needs to come down and say hello to me afterwards, <laughs> but if Oscar De La Renta was standing here today, I can promise you, if I was in your position, I would come down and I would say hello. And he's not going to be offended by that. He's going to be, you know, he's going to know that you're admiring his work. And that's a huge thing for a designer, to know people really like what you do. Networking is a big, big thing. And anyone else? Yes. Sure. Um, the first outfit is actually a micro model knit uh, top and a watercolor print. Um, the top outfit, the top is actually from a mill called Sardi, which is a beautiful Italian mill. Um, the uh, skirt is from a mill called Achille Pinto, which does beautiful jacquards and wonderful prints. Uh, the second outfit is a uh, 19 mummy charmeuse top with a foil printed skirt with an asymmetric cowl. Um, the whole idea with the asymmetric cowl is something that I developed when I was here at FIT. I was pretty much enthralled with the whole idea of cowls and draping and that sort of thing. If you find yourself in an interest of a certain idea or concept that you learn here, advance on it you know, study it more and really understand what the concept is and how you can apply it to what you're doing in your everyday job. Um, also, the whole idea of foil printing is a huge trend right now. Anything metallic, anything gold, silver, metal, copper uh, is huge. So being able to kind of bring that to the next level is also important. Uh, any trends that are happening, I'm not a big follower of trends, so to speak. I try to adapt them to more of my customer, and sometimes trends are a little too flashy for me. Um, and it also, giving a nod to a trend is one thing, but totally doing a collection that's all trend, it, to me it's not smart. It, it's, it, you know, I want customers, I want my customers to be able to take my clothes out of the closet three years from now and put them on and say, wow, I bought this three years ago, but look how great it still looks. Maybe he's doing something like that now. Let me go back to the store and see what else he's doing now, you know? Um, and if you do something that's only a trend and they can't ever wear it again, they're going to think, oh, well, he only does trend. I don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to buy any of, more of his clothes because you can't wear them, you know, more than one season. Um, the third outfit is actually a Tussa silk, hand beaded. It actually takes the factory a day to do the twin set. So if that says anything about the cost of the twin set. Um, the tank, I think, is about $150. The, um, canvas, uh, the, the cardigan is about $250 to $300. And the skirt is from a German mill called Zulig uh, with a beautiful detailed uh, tie at the waist. And anyone else? Yes. Um, so, uh, the price range for the fabrics. Um, I usually go with fabrics in between five and twenty-five U.S. dollars. Um, what I'm finding is that if you base a collection um, on that range, you can definitely fall into the bridge area. Um, also, what I'm finding is there's a lot of cloths out there that look very similar, and the price difference is huge. So just be aware of that. Because one thing that I did with my first collection is that I used all of my fabrics are Italian and German. Um, and what I'm finding is that the difference between a $10 cotton and a $15 cotton is not that huge, and it can make or break your profit structure. Um, and, and working within a good profit is so important. Um, that's one other thing that I should tell you is that if you ever start your own collection, um, it's a huge ordeal to try to figure out the pricing structure and to understand that major department stores are always charging back for the least little things. Um, automatically, a, a major department store asks for 8% off the top. So if you sell to a Neiman's, a Saks, they're automatically getting 8%. And usually, for a new designer, it's about 30%. So if you're working on a 65% markup, that basically just cut you in half. So just be careful. 
Anyone else? Yes. No. <laughs> they pay when they want to pay. <laughs> um, actually, actually, I've heard a few horror stories. Um, for the most part, you know, since I'm not selling at this point, I'm waiting to see sales come in before uh, November 15th. Um, you know, I'm I'm expecting some some trials and tribulations of, of having department stores pay on time. But it can be anywhere from three months to six months before you see money. Is that right, George? Six months. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. I'm sorry. Um, no, I wasn't. I was too busy. <laughs> Keep yourself occupied with, with, with clubs and things like that, but also realize that you know doing internships are important. Also, any fashion shows that are coming up, anything that you see out in the hallways, like that, you know, like the Brothers Fashion Show in China, that's a beautiful fashion show to be involved in, and you have to submit your work and things like that. But just take advantage of all those opportunities. Um, you know, I'm not saying don't go out and join clubs, but at the same time, understand where your priorities are. Okay. Now, that's what I call a lesson for all of us. I, I, I'm so impressed with Hilton's knowledge.